aloha. Thanks for joining us. Good morning for those in Hawaii, afternoon or evening for those elsewhere. Thanks so much for joining us at Think Tech Hawaii. <clears throat> and we have the good fortune to have with us today, Professor Emerita Vernelia Randall from University of Dayton School of Law, <clears throat> Professor Emeritus Ben Davis from University of Toledo School of Law and now teaching at Washington Lee School of Law and active professor and chair of the American Bar Association's dispute resolution section, David Larson in St. Paul, Minnesota. Welcome all of you. So rather than trying to attack shortcomings in current media, and by media, the spectrum is huge. It can't lump them all into one category. But if we were going to see the kind of responsible, balanced media coverage that would help us understand important issues and how to see them and how to see choices relating to them. What might that look like? And Professor Randall, you had started us off with the example of yet another recent shooting of an unarmed black man in a traffic stop. Yeah, a, a minor unregistered license plates. That's what it, the person was being stopped for. And that's always pretextual. I can't tell you how many times I had, for how long I have driven around with unregistered license plates because I forgot to do it. And the, my son came back. I'd been driving around for months and my son came back from uh, England and the very day that he drives the car, even though I've been driving it around for months, he gets stopped. So it's not, they're not running around stopping everybody. They're using it as a pretext. And so in this particular case, the, guy, the young man, um, let me get his name because I want to say his name, uh, Patrick Wyolia, I, I'm probably mispronouncing it, started walking away from the cop, probably getting mad. I can understand, you know, and the he got out and the, the cop, anyway, he started walking away from the cop. They, he walked across the lawn, the cop came after him and tackled him and then tried to tase him with a taser. And the, the cop touched him first cop tries to tase him with a taser. He struggles, walks some more. The cop tackles him a second time. He's on his stomach, laying on the ground, face down. The cop takes out his gun and shoots him at point blank range in the back of the head. Execution style. Videos from the cop, videos from, uh, there's all kind of videos showing this. So here's the problem we have, the twofold problem. And I think this was how the, the media, now the media has been a bit better on the coverage of this, but in general, what they do is slant the discussion so that it sounds like there was just some accident that happened. You know, the that, uh, you know, where they say, you, you know, if you, uh, this killer in New York killed X number of people, or the people who go into school shootings killed X number of people, they, they tend to soft pedal cop killings of unarmed people. It's not just black people, but it's disproportionately. So it, it it's, uh, I'd like to explore that some more, especially how we end up not really dealing with, uh, we don't have mechanisms in place to cause the cops, the, the institution of policing to change their behavior. So there's a lot there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I appreciate all those observations. Um, one thing in terms of our media and how things are being presented to us, one thing they ask is, how diverse is the media outlet? Because if you've got a diverse media outlet, maybe you are going to get some of those different perspectives. So I think that's an important consideration. Um, if we want stories to be reported in a very 
diverse way in terms of perspectives, then we need a diverse media. And, uh, and I don't know that that's happening everywhere, although I'd like to think it's getting better. Um, I think as viewers, we just always right now have to keep in mind that media has a lot of control when it comes to selecting the stories they want, how they present those stories, what's the perspective. And one thing that happens that happens in all kinds of intercommunication is that we, we frame our stories um, and that sets up the acceptance of the, of the conclusion. So you frame the story before you tell it, and then you kind of take, you, take it to a conclusion, but the conclusion is a little foretold because of the way you frame the story. And we just have to be aware of that as consumers of media, that that's happening. And um, we just can't always be led by the nose to a particular conclusion. Um, and the other thing with media, it's just really interesting. We, we talk a lot about explicit and implicit bias um, in employment. We talk about it all the time. And I think there's a lot of awareness growing in employment about implicit bias and that we have to set up some, some processes to address that and overcome that. I don't hear nearly as much discussion about implicit bias when it comes to uh, news media. The idea that uh, we know that there are some explicitly biased stations and there's a question of what is that okay or is it not? It's a little better okay if they tell us their perspective. Um, people are going to have different perspectives, at least, at least if they're honest about their perspective, that helps a lot. Um, but when it comes to media, uh, you know, the people telling the stories are gonna have implicit unconscious bias just like employers are. And uh, I don't think there's probably been enough discussion about that. Yeah, and let's maybe add another aspect of it is that uh, media are private owned. Private owned media is for the most part uh, uh, looking for maximizing its profitability. You know, the famous, if it bleeds, it leads, right? Ratings and all that and advertising and all. And um, saying something that is uh, not uh, a regularly used line of approach or frame, let's say let's, there's a frame as was said, that frame and doing it differently than the, that, that frame is not something that sells maybe. And so that, you know, you have that, that difficulty of, of what will sell or what we're not. I, I'm reminded, of course, everyone is reminded here of the George Floyd uh, case again, where the thing was is actually the media uh, was uh, kind of stepped through because you had this private video of what was eight minutes and 26 seconds that no one could deny. I mean, it was just running the thing. You hear the people telling the police officer to get off of the person. I mean, and it, and it just, the, you know, that you couldn't snip it in a way or frame it in a way that was anything else than what it was. And I'm not exactly certain, although there were efforts to do it, I'm not exactly certain, uh, you know, the, the, the frame couldn't be kept, right? The frame couldn't be kept. So then what did the frame turn into? It turned sort of like what a loose can police officer, that's another frame, right? Which is basically saying that there's not a systemic problem, that there was a a bad police officer. We have all these different sort of standard frames that are used in these settings. Um, and uh, whenever somebody tries to raise the fact that there's a systemic kind of problem that is there, you know, that's uh, not profitable. And we always, we're, we're always pushed away from looking at any systemic problem. But I can give you another example. I just got an email or something I read, which was looking at the 400 most uh, the 400 highest income individuals in the United States and the tax rates that they paid, right? You know, and we never talk about that. You know, I mean, we, we it doesn't become a central issue because it's not a frame that is profitable. I, I'm sorry, for being it, so I, it's, I think it's I think that profitability is a big factor. I also think the political uh, leanings of corporate meetings. Cor corporations are, are the are media corporations, there's five large ones, 
are conservative, uh, center right or center left, and except you know one or two who are really right. There is no really progressive uh, large media, so there's no. So that's a problem. And one of the things the law could do is break up the media, sort of like they did AT and T, and basically said, look, you know what? It's you're too big to control all of this. We have to have room from other voices for other political viewpoints. And there can be no room as long as you know, it's concentrated in four or five. You could do that. You could also uh, forbid local ownership of uh, media. The other, most people don't realize that their local news shows, local uh, media, their lo local stations are owned by one of the large media companies for the most part. Are and so we could break that up, but. I think in terms of this whole issue with police officers, I think it it doesn't sell because the people, the American public is uninterested in it. Uh, it's not just if it leads, it bleeds. Well, you know, it, there's a lot of bleeding in police killing uh, someone. Uh, I think it doesn't sell because uh, we don't want it to sell because we we want the police. Uh, we want this vision of the police as a bunch of good people and. Uh, in the system, not just the individual police. I think Ben made a good point that, you know, th we're talking about media and we're talking about television stations, but media is a lot more than that today. And the fact that that, was, that event with George Floyd and murder with George Floyd was filmed um, from start to finish um, and then presented something that has been, I think, very properly observes that it's something you couldn't really without exposing the heavy editing you were doing, you really had to present it as it was, that became an extremely powerful event because of that opportunity that social media presented. So, um, you know, as we talk about breaking up the media and breaking up power, we, we have to talk about Meta, formerly Facebook and Google and some of the internet powers that are controlling yeah. some of the conversation now also. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about that. Not much has happened as far as I can tell. But uh, when we talk about the power and the ability of pretty much 90% of the population is uh, accessing the internet, probably more than that as we sit there in 2022. I mean, if you wanna, if you wanna get people's attention, uh, it's online. Um, and so as much as we pay attention to television and radio, we have to pay attention to the to the internet too, and yeah, that see. raises all kinds of interesting questions. Because when you're on the internet, um, you get these virtual echo chambers set up, where just the same message keeps getting repeated and amplified exponentially, and it gets said over and over, and suddenly people all believe it. And we saw that with the January sixth assault on the Capitol, that they kept talking about a conspiracy and saving America and saving democracy, and people kept hearing it and hearing it and hearing it, and they actually be believed it, and so they attacked and committed all kinds of crimes resulting in the death of a number of people. So uh, as we think about media and power, we do have to think about the internet and the ability of two things really. I think the what scare me are these virtual echo chambers that really hyper get people hyper excited, um, number one. And then this whole idea of these, uh, and, and Ben always is very attentive to this, um, you know, the power and danger of algorithms and the fact that when we go online, everything we're doing online is getting tracked and everything that we're going to receive tomorrow is based on what we access ourselves. And pretty soon, all we're going to be getting fed are things consistent with what we've accessed before. And that's the message we're going to get repeated. And we're going to come to believe that that's kind of what the news is and what the world believes. And it isn't. And we just need to be ourselves, take some responsibility and understand that things are being pushed out to us 
in ways that really may not may not be reliable, and we need to make an effort to to find some um, some different viewpoints. I think I could I agree with you. I just don't know that the way most people I I'm in a different lines and I've come disturbed by how readily and freely people share stuff that that has no factual basis and when you question them about it like uh, the most recent one for me was uh what's his name the actor black actor Will Smith? Uh, no not Will Smith uh older black actor Denzel no Bill, Co I, Bill Cosby <laughs> I, I, don't multiple, say anymore I won't it. It, 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 he plays presidents all the time oh Morgan Freeman Morgan Freeman more they someone had met someone had a meme with Morgan Freeman saying something and so my question was to the person who shared it did he say that or is this someone's meme? Did they just use his likeness to put words in his mouth? And their answer was they didn't know and didn't care. Right. They right. they they liked the meaning. I said, but that's how you know that's how this information, because you, somebody is going to say, Morgan Freeman said X. Yeah. And then before you know it, everybody's on the internet saying Morgan Freeman said this, when someone just made up a meme. And the echo chamber thing, I'm also really, I had another instance where someone said, I'm on one of the Facebook line I'm on, they said, those liberals aren't going to take away my rights as a parent. They're going to be surprised. And so I said, okay, so what rights are the liberals trying to take away? Quiet, no response. But that, but the echo chamber they were in, people agreed without even being able to articulate what their fear was. Yeah. 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 So I, I think you're right. I think the internet may be harder to control because I don't know that I think individual responsibility is not going to cut it. Mm. So well, I, I think the echo chambers can be, are going to be developed by people who are not taking individual responsibility. And that's going to be 99% of the people. And when people like you and I and Ben and others try to say something to them, they're going to get mad because they think you're trying to ruin the dump on them in an inappropriate way. Yeah. And, and I, I was just thinking that, uh, you know, the, the feed that you'll get is the, and the algorithm that you get in the feed, its intent is to get you stimulated, right? So that you keep going, right? I mean, it, right. I, 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 I did a rant the other day about something that I got as a, from somebody, uh, and uh, it was, the term was Negropean, right? As yeah. I wrote the term Negropean, a Facebook link came up for something called Negropeans Ain't Shite, S-H-Y-T-E. And I was like, I could click on that and I would be all of a sudden taken to some website where, you know, it was, but I was like, wow, interesting. Look how this algorithm, as soon as I put the word in, tried to take me to something to provoke me, you know, yeah. just like yeah. that. I mean, it's a word I had never used in all these years, right? And I was like, hmm, you know, maybe as part of antitrust law, which I understand sometimes is taught as a historic <laughs> law as opposed to an actual law being applied, uh, that's sort of tongue in cheek, right? <laughs> but the idea is that as antitrust law, you know, part of what it could be would be about requiring the actual if you don't break up the organization, requiring the algorithms to be transparently available to everyone. Publicly available. Publicly available uh, that they can be scrutinized. 
and they, they become in the, the public domain, you know, because of the impact that they could potentially have. I mean, I don't know, but uh, I think that's but, a great idea. You know, mainly I mean, because what those those, you know, garbage in, garbage out. And one of the garbage in is racism, implicit yeah. bias, discrimination. Those the just because it's being done by a computer doesn't make it free of racial bias and and uh, make it free. It's not the algorithm is not racially biased. It is programmed to perform in a racially biased way. Yeah, I mean, there, there are people writing on that kind of stuff I know of, you know, uh, where, um, you know, like doing Google searches and what comes up as the top search kind of things that, you know. Um, but I, I want to uh, mention a, a book coming out sometime soon by a guy named Chris Draper, who has come up with, I think, the greatest term. I haven't heard anybody use it except called digital robber barons and i said that's mm. exactly that we are only data anymore we're not like ourselves we are this data that gets exploited right and that concept of you know the 19th century robber barons and the antitrust reaction to it and thinking of all of these spaces as dealing with digital robber barons and you know the, the same kind of uh um uh, of uh sort of rapacious predatory nature that um, I think is really, really something that that's powerful. I mean, I saw, for example, you know, Amazon had a union, right? Right? Uh, named at their Staten Island facility. And that Amazon has a sort of employee chat technology where it specifies certain kinds of words can't be used in it, you know? Like if you use the word union, I don't know what happens, but probably get fired. You know what I mean? They were like words you can't use in a so-called speaking space because it's a privately controlled, constructed algorithmic space that affects, I don't know how many thousands, hundreds of thousands of Amazon employees in the spaces in which they, they are, you know? Um, but that's just within one company. You can think of any company in the world right now that is somehow doing the linked employees kind of situation and, and these dialogue spaces of any kind. And you can ask yourself, to what extent is there some kind of limit being placed on what can be said? I'll go you know, even farther. Just I'll add one other thing. I got, uh, I worked at a place where there was this thing called Microsoft Viva, right? You know, and it would read my emails and then send me the next day a message about sort of like a to-do list that was generated by the Microsoft Viva based on decrypting what the emails I got the day before said. And I tried to delete it. You know, I said, I don't want this. And guess what? It was like Groundhog Day every day. I am back. Here I am. You know, I mean, it's heavy, these kinds of things that, yeah. that are. I got a similar kind of thing that kind of summarized my daytime activity online, which which is, says, here's, here's the minute you spent doing this and this and this and this. I said, I don't, want, I don't necessarily want this out there of, of the internet where it could be intercepted. Um, so yeah. that was very disturbing. But I, you know, I, I do believe that we, we do need to take some responsibility to educate ourselves. But I also appreciate the fact brought up by Professor Randall that maybe people aren't going to do it because it's hard, takes a lot of time. So I particularly like Ben's idea of making some of this transparent. Okay, so we'll make it easier for you. you know, let's, let's make the information easily accessible so that you don't have to dig it up. It's right in front of you. And if you want to understand how you're being manipulated, it's, it's very easy to do. And yeah, I really, I like that idea, not as a necessarily an end around to the antitrust laws, but a no. way to kind of respond to the fact that maybe they're not being um, implemented as aggressively as one would think they should be. So this is a, yeah, this is a really interesting discussion. And, and, and if we could go another way with it, it's like, there's like degrees of things, right? So for example, we're talking sort of basically in the civil kind of space, but I, I've seen something about uh, the use of in pre-sentencing reports of uh, these algorithmic things to make a decision about how dangerous somebody is in terms of recidivism or something like that in criminal sense. 
And the idea is that, you know, defense counsel would like to know what the algorithm is that based that number off, of, right? And then it's a, it's a, it's a contract between the, 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 the court and the company that provides this that would have in it something that would say, you, you know, you can't reveal this intellectual property, right? And, and uh, so it's, it's like a black box, right? That's basically it. And there's like this whole black box versus white box versus gray box discussion. But, but that's in a particular setting of criminal processes where judges make decisions, part of it being informed by something that's coming out of an algorithm, you know? Uh, it's not the same as social media, but it's this, you might say there's heightened scrutiny maybe in that kind of space as opposed to other areas. I don't know, I, you know, but, uh, and I'm not even convinced that having, I mean, I think that having these, uh, transparency is one thing but uh that would be good but you know there's a lot of transparency is transparency really is really people who, you know is what i'm trying to say who have their transparency, own transparency is a start but at the end of the day i think the law has to be structured in a way to make people to make organizations and systems responsible because if you rely on individuals it's just not going to happen no matter yeah, how regular. much transparency goes on yeah. uh maybe transparent make i mean maybe the thing i one of the flaws i have with the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as a, an effective tool for 21st century discrimination is so much of the discrimination is hidden from the individual and relying on an individual to bring lawsuit means that organizations who would monitor have to spend a lot of time finding someone to bring mm. a lawsuit. One of the things we could do, both in terms of suing in a lots of areas, is say organizations can have standing to sue based on data they've collected and uh and information they've collected and they don't have to find an individual person that's been harmed by media or by uh discrimination they can bring a lawsuit that would be a that would be a way of putting more impact than just individual responsibility because then you would have organizations who would take it upon themselves to uh, collect the data and sue on the day's data especially if the law gave them uh, attorney fees and punitive damages for repeated violations well, that is the theory of the EOC. <laughs> that's, that's why we have an EOC. The problem is that it has always been understaffed. Um, I had an appointment, a uh, managerial appointment at the Appellate Division in Washington. And the, the, the caseload for EAC, EOC employees was the highest in the federal government. Um, it was so overwhelmed with cases that it just couldn't begin to address the problems around the country. So certainly one thing we could do is better fund and staff the EOC, the Federal Enforcement Agency, so that they can take on a lot of more, a lot more of these cases. And they can file lawsuits, but they don't have the resources and personnel necessary to do a, a comprehensive job. Yeah. One of the problems I've seen, I, I agree with you, the EOC. One of the problems is EOC is subject to political administrative. Yeah oversight and funding and so any particular emphasis and then all the administrations democrat and republicans they're not that interested in really kind of correcting the funding correcting the thing by changing the law so that a nonprofit organizations can bring a lawsuit without having to have an individual person you would give there would be organizations who hold uh you know their whole thing in life would be to hunt down and file lawsuits against organizations who were basically doing it. Sort of like 
what happens with class actions, but better because you're not looking to have to try to articulate and get class approval. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's, so, an important observation. that's an important observation about the EOC. And if you recall, Clarence Thomas was chair mm -hmm. of the EOC before he came to the Supreme Court. And when he was chair of the EOC, he said that the EOC is no longer going to bring disparate impact claims, one of the theories of discrimination. Well, that's one way, one of the best ways to get at any kind of systemic discrimination is to bring a disparate impact claim, which is a wide reaching spanning kind of claim. But yes, the EOC is subject to political influences and he's a political appointee from a conservative administration. And what he said is we're just not gonna bring those anymore because I don't think that's what we should be doing. We should be focusing on the individual cases of discrimination. So- And I hate to do this, but we're out of time for today. Yeah, no. We've we had a good on another high point. <clears throat> and you folks have somehow wound your way through the mess to point us forward to directions that may make more sense for responsible understanding and change. Thank you so much. Come back, Thank see you. us in two weeks. We'll be back. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.